Um, if we have uh, Johannes uh, online, uh, Johannes, you can uh, start your screen share. Okay. And that will replace my screen. And then I'll, uh, once your screen is share starts, I'll introduce you. Yep. Is this working? I seem to, I cannot start the video. Yeah. Uh, the host has stopped it, it says that again, but otherwise, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, can perfect. See your screen. Okay. That's great. Great. So uh, let's get started with this session. Uh, I'm uh, chairing this session, and I'd like to warmly welcome Johannes Garta, uh, who is going to be delivering the first keynote talk of ICD 2020. Johannes is a technical fellow at Microsoft, where he is leading architecture and machine learning in the intelligent communication and conversations cloud, uh, which is a lot about what this conference is, I think, uh, but he will tell us more about it uh, in his keynote talk, which we are looking forward to hearing. Uh, Johannes did his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1999, and from then till 2015, he was in the faculty of the Department of Computer Science at Cornell University. And then uh, via a startup, uh, he eventually joined Microsoft, uh, where he decided to do uh, more uh, applied research. And uh, the fruits of that uh, are going to impact us in very interesting ways, which he'll be telling us about. Johannes has received numerous awards uh, through his career, including an NSF Career Award, the Sloan Research Fellowship, a Humboldt Research Fellowship, the 2011 uh, IEEE Computer Society Technical Achievement Award, and he is an ACM Fellow. He's also a co-author of the undergrad textbook Database Management Systems with Raghu Ramakrishnan, which is currently in its uh, third edition. Uh, it's called The Cowbook. And he was program chair of a number of leading conferences, including uh, ICD itself, KDD, VLDB, and SOCC. So, Johannes, over to you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, I have quite a bit of echo here, but maybe that'll go away. So, I want to start um, right away with... Um, uh, sort of the context of um, uh, the talk, um, namely that right now I'm at Microsoft and I work in Office 365, which is one of the largest collaboration clouds. Um, we have you know, over 180 million active Office users. You know, there are a billion meetings set up each month, like this one. Billions of documents are created each month. And so what I'm working uh, at is actually uh, called Microsoft Teams. Um, it basically has three different um, goals. One of them is to connect the dots that basically good teams, they just don't meet for the sake of a meeting. A good meeting usually involves upfront prep and post bidding follow through and the data is in silos and across apps and Teams brings all of this together. The second one is that Teams is really uh, focusing on inclu inclusivity, um, inclusiveness, namely there's a diverse global workforce from lots of different generations with different expectations and basically Teams includes features where everyone's voice is heard regardless on where they are and the level of technology proficiency. And the last one is that as teams and products go large and more dynamic, we need to evolve the organizational culture towards transparency. And so therefore we need to redesign the tools just to bring everything together. Um, so these are the three um, tenants and you know, Teams also includes voice and video calling uh, similar to, to Zoom what we're using right now here. I just wanna show a few features and, and that'll bring me sort of to the main part of my talk. So here's um, an example of audio um, and how we actually do crystal clear audio in ultra low bandwidth. The coffee stand is too high for the couch. The coffee stand is too high for the couch. So I hope that you, you hear the difference between the two. Um, similarly, when you um, work in noisy environments and in open space, um, we can Eliminate background noise, here's an example. And now there are my suppression on the uh, and the see that you know we very often we have meetings where a few meeting, uh, people join remotely and then there's a heated discussion. You've probably seen this with um, you know PhD you uh, with PhD students and colleagues, right? And then you go into the whiteboard, but some people are remote. So and then now somebody takes out their cell phone to take pictures and share them. 
And so what we basically have is we have created um, in collaboration with MSR, we have basically the idea that, so the, the, you can make the picture work with real-time streaming. And so we add a deep learning segmentation to filter out the person who's blocking the whiteboard. And the result is what you see at the bottom right, which is basically an enhanced whiteboard view for remote people in real time. Um, we cannot really completely look through the person yet, as you've seen it, but we're working on that as well. So uh, let, let me go on and actually talk a little bit about um, uh, resource management in teams. So, and, and I'll, I'll make the connection to database systems in a minute. So if you look at resource management in these applications, it's quite complex because it has to work over various networks, 2G, 3G, LTE, you know, wireless LAN, LAN, and so on. Lots of different platforms, and lots of different hardware with different capabilities and power conditions. And what um, our engineers have done over the years is they've identified several hero conditions and have done um, hand-tuned parameter tuning for video resources, audio jitter for control, bandwidth estimation, and so on. So if you look at the overall high-level architecture, there's basically the capture, encoding and sending, and the receiving and decoding, and that's the data plane, and then there's basically a control plane, which controls capture rate controller, quality controller, and a bandwidth estimation at the very highest level. And so the journey that we're on right now is that we're taking these 150,000 lines of code for the red blocks, which is basically you know, a decade of hand-tuned parameters, really thoughtfully done um, very often um, uh, by, you know, by teams that have done very careful experiments. And what we're trying to do is now we're taking all of these red pieces, basically the control plane, and replacing it with machine learning control. And maybe what we can do even, we might as well, hopefully, or at some point in future time, maybe replace also really large parts of the data plane with machine learning control or well, with, uh, with, with the machine learning model. So let's compare these two different approaches, right? On the, on the left-hand side, you have the traditional approach, right? Where you basically have you know, lots of code, hand-tuned parameters. The interesting thing is that of all the learning here, the expertise is done by developers who add new code and new rules. Um, this requires networking, coding experts that have a steep ramp up time. There are people who have PhDs and uh, who are really experts in this area. And then we have new network and device support. It basically needs you know, somebody to go ahead and write more code. On the right-hand side, potentially, you have a simpler architecture. Many fewer lines of code, no hand-tuned parameters, no hand-coded rules. Everything is automatically learned from data. And we have though, now very different expertise, right? You have machine learning, deep learning, and maybe reinforcement learning expertise required. And then if I now have new network and device support, um, I need more training data. So actually the power is shifted away from code to the data. So here's just an example of what we can do. So, so again, so I've looked at sort of this whole data plane here and, and let, me, let me zoom in a little bit. Um, so previously, you start with a microphone, then you go through analog gain control, echo cancellation, noise suppression, voice activity detection, key tap suppression, digital gain control, and then howling suppression, or suppression, and, and, uh, suppression. And then what we're doing is we can take these three red boxes and, and complete, uh, compress them into one green box, where the green box is a model. Let me just show you a little bit of the kind of quality that we can uh, generate. So this is Babel noise. So here's an example of um, what uh, this Babel noise creates. Your curiosity went happily out of bounds. So this is the noisy data, then with existing tech. Um, Your curiosity went happily out of bounds. You know, so the Babel noise in the background is a little bit gone, but if you actually now have a deep model. Your curiosity went happily out of bounds. You see that, that the, the noise is completely gone. And you probably have been in a meeting where it's joined remotely and somebody has been eating. Chips. Eternity is no time for recriminations. And with existing tech again. Eternity is no time you for see recriminations. The noise is basically not gone at all. Eternity is no time for First, recriminations. You see with the deep we can basically completely um, eliminate background noise completely. And you know, in, in a situation like now where everybody is working remotely and you know have children at home, uh, pets, and, and other activities at home. This is a really great capability. Your curiosity. Your curiosity. So another example that we actually have seen and, and that I was very intimately involved um, with as well is actually where I've seen this power of data and models in enterprise search. So if you go 15, 20 years back, right, and in real 2005, this is Bjorn Oldstad, um, who was the CTO of FAST at that point in time. He presented basically the FAST technology, which was basically a really cool search engine 
enterprise search engine based on an inverted index technology with some really cool tricks. Um, however, enterprise search, which is basically where you have a corpus in the enterprise and you have to search over the whole corpus, has never worked as well as internet search. And, and there are actually structural differences basically in the enterprise where I have Word documents and PowerPoint documents and, and other documents, I don't have a link structure. I have very little information about the importance of sites. So if Sudarshan uh, stores some documents on, on his um, you know, OneDrive and I uh, store some on my OneDrive, we don't know which one of these is more important. And also because the population which searches over this corpus is much smaller, there are just very few searches and clicks across the corpus. Um, so, however, if you now compare this now with the power of data, this is actually why I came to Microsoft in 2013 to build this. What we can do now is actually in the cloud with Office 365, we actually see who is working on what context and on what documents. So basically, if you look at a document to see, you can see with whom the document has been shared, um, in which emails the document has been attached. You can see who's colleagues of, uh, uh, who's, who are the people who are working with each other. Um, and so you can basically overlay all of these signals. They are automatically generated just by people working in the cloud across all of this content. And with this content now, you can do two things. First of all, you can now use this data rich signals or the, the, this, this data asset to create new experiences. On the left hand side is an experience that we've created uh, is called Dell, which is basically a relevant feed um, for you. And on the right hand side, you can also now pivot content around entities. For example, if I want to find that document that Sudarshan shared with me last week, maybe I just go to Sudarshan's Dell and there directly see it. So we have sort of these mental anchors that you can now link content around. And that's really transformed uh, at Microsoft and, and, and everywhere how we're doing enterprise search, that basically now enterprise search has become a signal rich environment where um, we now have what we originally called the office graph and it's now become the Microsoft graph. Um, which basically gives signals to us and of all of our tenants um, to build these models and, and create value for our customers. Now, let's go back. Let's compare these two different models of working, right? Again, this was traditional noise suppression, which is signal processing, compared to new noise suppression, which was deep learning, as well as a traditional enterprise search with inverted indices, as compared to new enterprise search with this data rich and models for ranking. So on the left-hand side in software 1.0, you program with code. On the right-hand side, you program with code, data, and model. On the left-hand side, you have domain expertise, whereas on the right side, you have ML expertise. What a programmer does on the left-hand side, they transfer expertise to code, whereas on the right-hand side, maybe you just collect data. On the left-hand side, you have code complexity. On the right-hand side, you have data plus search gives you models. And on the left-hand side, you design clever algorithms that you've learned in, in textbooks and that you've come up with. Maybe the right-hand side has all these algorithms directly in the models. And again, the, the left-hand side software 1.0 gets better with better code, whereas the right-hand side gets better with more data and, of course, also better models. The hope on the right-hand side is that it adapts with more data and is much less um, hard-coded and brittle. And actually, how you work is all very different. I'll come back to this in the end, namely that on the left-hand side, you write code, whereas on the right-hand side, you, you know, design model architectures and infrastructure and you label and collect data. And the interesting thing is, and, and you see this now, um, and Sudarshan talked about the program here where there are lots of exciting papers actually in this space in general, is that this is happening now in our area as well. This is happening in database systems and also in many other areas of computer science, you know, systems networking, PL and so on. Um, and actually you could therefore imagine that even what we have learned about database systems, um, you know, over time gets less and less relevant because a lot of the things that we thought we actually did traditionally, um, like a query optimizing, a query optimizer in, uh, indexing and so on, are now replaced with things that actually are automatically learned from data. So, so where does sort of the software 2.0 and database systems meet? And, and they clearly meet along many different dimensions and I don't have time to talk about all of them here at all. Um, there's clearly a lot of really great work of integrating machine learning into database systems. And there's a lot of great work on applying machine learning to database systems. But what I want to talk about here now is um, the, the third sort of big bullet component here, which is the, the idea of changing parts of a database system to models. And so what I want to take now is the second third of this talk and sort of give you a little bit of an intuition of 
what kind of work you can do here in this area. And I would say that this area is still very much in its infancy. And I'll also point this out. And, uh, and then afterwards, in the last part of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about how we actually change our way of working with respect to now actually having models in code. So, so this is the rest of the talk. So basically, um, I'll talk a little bit about this learned X and database systems. And then I'll conclude with some thoughts about you know, how software development changes. OK, so how does this learned X actually work? Right? So basically, what you do with the learned X, the idea is, well, I just take something that I have traditional code with and I replace it with a model. I could do this in a database system in the control plane, um, where I have lots of different choices, like resource management and so on, or in the data plane, where you know, I basically directly are involved uh, during query processing. And one thing that I've seen many times now um, at Microsoft is that initially models are not great, but they improve over time. And they improve as we get more data. They improve as we learn more about the usage of the models, as we build better models, just in terms of model architecture, as we build more efficient models, you know, we quantize model and, and models and have a better understanding of quality versus resource trade-offs but also as we lean, learn how to deal with having models in our code. And, and that, that's a really big change that I'll talk about in a second. So, so I wanna talk about two simple problems here, just to give you an intuition of what it means to apply um, or, or, or replace pieces with, um, with models here. And one of them is a physical data layout for interactive analytics. Um, so here the problem is very simple, namely that we have this trend that there is scan-oriented data processing for large-scale analytics. So what you do is you partition data into blocks stored on disk or remote storage, and then you build some block level small materialized aggregates such as per field min and max to see whether you can skip a block. And then you retrieve and scan and full scan blocks if they're relevant to an issued query. And there is a lot of relevant work about this. And one of the key uh, metrics here is for a given query load, workload, I need to optimize the total number of blocks or tuples accessed. And the main idea is basically, well, once we have these blocks, we can assign records to blocks intelligently and we can skip blocks when running queries. So what this means is that we now optimize the total size of blocks accessed during querying. Um, and this is basically workload aware because we can optimize it for a given data set and query workload. And again, this is, this is a very initial step and hopefully this actually evolves along with the database as the database changes. And, and we've tried to do this in our design, even though we're not, not there by far. Um, and so the desirable properties of such an assignment is that, well, the block contents can be easily described as predicates or fields. So if I have a record or if I have a query, I can easily check whether a, rec uh, a block is relevant for this query or not. And then also uh, completeness, namely then that I know that a block contains all the records matching a given description. And, and this actually has significant potential. So we have tried this out on a real data set. Um, that was actually the motivating use case here, where the scan selectivity of, of you know, a large workload is less than 0.1%, which is the theoretical lower bound. Um, and basically, if you look at actually um, what is happening is that in prior work, you, know, you get about 5 or 12% um, scan selectivity, whereas in our solution, um, you go down to 0.4% and 0.2%. So, you know, not at the theoretical lower bound, but, but quite close to it. And you can do the same thing actually for TBCH as well, um, where our solution actually improves significantly as well. So I think the, the, the um, I want to give you an intuition of the solution, but then especially I want to tell you about the approach that we took because I think it's an interesting approach because in the approach we specifically designed for the future. So we have this new learned data structure, which we call a query data routing tree. And Basically, the simple idea is that this is just a decision tree where each internal node has two children. Each node corresponds to some basically a data subspace and you have a cut at each node. So the root corresponds to the entire data set and then each node cuts the data space into two children. So it's a simple decision tree, right? I mean, when you think about, you know, in the last um, couple of decades, right, decision trees was one of the early um, data mining tools. So this is actually nothing else. And so basically now the leaves have a complete semantic description of conceptually this hypercube that they uh, encompass. You can have unary cuts and you can have categorical cuts for categorical attributes where we have a bit vector which says um, which value appears on which side. 
Now the question is how do you con deconstruct such a tree? And now there are different optimization methods. You know, a simple solution would be greedy, another extreme might be dynamic programming. Um, and, and you know, there are actually lots of other um, possibilities out there. Um, and one approach that we took is basically we use deep reinforcement learning. And, and the, high, the intuition is that actually, not that the problem right now is actually really an MDP, but actually that with changes in the database, we're actually prepared for this next step that we want to take. And, and we're not there at all. So basically in the greedy approach, it's basically the, the typical top-down decision tree construction. You begin with all the tuples in a single block. In each iteration, you split a leaf node whose size is larger than you know, 2B, which is sort of a threshold into two children nodes and choose the cut that mix, ma maximizes some metric. Um, you can really easily see that there are cases where it's clear that you don't want to be greedy and where greedy makes the wrong choice. It's the same issue as in decision tree construction. And therefore what we do is we want to use an alternative search um, procedure. Um, you know, again, we use reinforcement learning really not because this is a sequential decision process, right? So usually when you look at fields as robotics or so, they've used MDPs because, well, there's a robot and the robot needs to make decision, a sequence of decisions as it navigates its environment. And you basically, you know, have to make the sequence of decisions to get to the end. In here, this is not really a sequential nature of the partition problem, right? It's basically, there's no agent interacting with the environment. Um, really what we have is basically just a cost function overall, not really a reward. However, in the database system, the database system is not a static um, object. It's changing over time. Tables can grow and shrink. And so therefore, we are hoping that as we get to this next step, we have modeled the problem in a way such that this next step will be easy. So basically what we do is we build this learned QD tree now using deep reinforcement learning. The states right now are the hypercube. The actions, the candidate cuts that we have. And then we have a policy, which is basically a distribution of possible actions, the possible cuts that we can take. Um, I don't want to go too much into details now here, but basically what this shows is if you have, you know, either a denormalized TBCH, again, there's a restriction because we cannot do it yet over joints and so on. Um, and, and in real life data sets, we show that, for example, if you use TBCH on a distributed spark, we actually get an overall speed of 1.6x. And, um, if you include templates that actually scan all the data anyway, it's 2.6x. And there are some queries where you get significant speed up. And, and similarly, actually on a commercial database system as well. And then similarly, as I've shown on the real workload, if you just look at the logical speed up directly there, and actually we get on a commercial database system here with this um, workload, we get about a 400x gain compared to the baseline. Um, there, we actually have significant improvements as well. So I just want to show this not because this is a cool algorithm, but basically it shows that if you use the traditional methods and compare now this decision of how to partition your data um, through a model, you basically are now um, can partition the data set to optimize for this given uh, data set and workload, um, but also you're now actually hopefully prepared for the future. And that's actually now where there's a lot of open questions. Basically, how do we handle multiple tables? How do we handle time-based predicates? And especially, how do we handle database and workload changes, which was the motivation for using reinforcement learning in the first place, right? Otherwise, I could have just built a deep model, for example, that gives me a cost function and then used any kind of other optimization algorithm. Let me give you another example. Um, so this is an example where we use this in physical layout. Another example is in indices. And, and this is um, you know, a paper that actually became um, quite well known the case for learned index structures by Krafka et al. in Sigma 2018. The main idea is, is, is similar to this query routing tree, is that if you look at traditional index structures, such as a B tree index or um, a hash map, basically what they do is they take a key and give you a position. Well, and this function from a key to position, it doesn't have to be encoded in a B tree, it could be encoded in a model. Um, whether it's a deep model or not, that's, that's not the question. And so in a hash map, what does a hash map do? do? It takes a key and takes a hash function and then gives you a location. And in a learned hash map, similarly, you replace that hash function um, with a model. In, in the 
the hope is that if I have this learned index and I compare it now to a B tree, that maybe I have faster queries because the tree is more compact and I don't have to make that many comparisons and my index size is much smaller. Okay. And so the learned index basically um, had this hierarchical model, which actually looks quite a bit like a B tree where I replace the internal nodes just with models. So I have a root model and um, then I, you know, the model tells me to which child model I should go. I basically apply a function that gives me the index of the model at the next level, and I go to that model and then a recurse. Okay, and, and there were some details on how the search actually um, converged. And what the, uh, what the work by CrossCut all shows is that this gives me actually 3x faster lookups and about an order of magnitude size um, um, compression compared to B plus trees. However, the drawback is that this works only for static and read-only workloads. So, so the design goals now here in this space, again, are basically let's take this initial model, which is a learned index, and which has some interesting properties and can see how can we expand this. So again, if you take the learned index, which is you know, a fast lookup time, unfortunately, no insertion and low space usage, can we do the same thing? With lookup time, maybe we can make it a little bit faster. That's a general optimization. But how we actually can, can we actually make it um, uh, updatable with insertions. And so basically what we do in Alex is um, we basically expand RMIs with um, a few relatively simple ideas. And by the way, for indices, simple ideas are good because in the end you actually have to implement this. Um, and the simpler the index is that you have to implement, um, the easier it will be to implement and the fewer bugs you'll have. So the, the main idea is that we have now variable size nodes nodes where the size is determined by actually the data set and the distribution. So basically, if the model fits the current distribution well, then we actually have potentially very large nodes. And we have a search strategy is optimized for models where we basically do inserts based on the model as well, and then combine with exponential search. And that gives us basically a very compact index with nice caching behavior. Okay, let me just give you a brief overview of how this works. So. Alex is, which is um, in the uh, adaptive learned index, which is uh, the name of this index. You basically start at the, at the root. You have again a hierarchy of models and the high level models picks the models at the next level. And then the leaf level model predict, uh, predicts the position. And at the leaf nodes, basically one idea is just to leave gaps. You leave free spaces, which then efficiently absorbs the inserts. And you can use model-based inserts, which lead to faster lookups. And actually, this simple idea already takes you very far because once you've built this index, you can go to the leaves. Once the leaf is full, you can potentially just double the leaf because if the distribution has not changed, well, then maybe the model that's there at the leaf or you can construct a new model actually still captures the distribution. So in a way, what you do is you, do, you have an overall distribution of key values and you basically approximate this distribution with either piecewise linear or let's say um, a, um, you know other functions that, that you have at the leaf nodes. So if you have now look up, you just you know use this recursive model index to predict the location of the key in a leaf node, and then within this leaf node you use exponential search starting at the predicted location. And then we have some tricks such that the holes don't um, cost you too much. If an insert as well, well you use the recursive model index to predict the location where the key should be inserted in the leaf data node. If the predict location is empty, great, you insert the key. That means actually if you ever search for that key, you actually find it really quickly as well. Otherwise, you shift the existing keys towards the closest gap. Okay. And so there are basically mechanisms to dynamically grow Alex, which says if a node becomes full, you allocate a new larger node by some expansion factor. I, I suggested two, but you can you know, pick any factor C and you can scale or retrain the model. And even the model node maybe becomes too big or becomes too skewed, then you have to split into two nodes, but now you actually split it downwards. And basically the insertion algorithms combines these different splitting mechanisms with policies and when to do this. Let me just give you an intuition of, of how fast this actually works. So basically, if you look at Alex compared to the learned index, the model B tree, the regular B plus tree, uh, plus tree and an adaptive radix tree, Alex actually has um, really good uh, read throughput. Um, and actually, even if you look at, uh, um, so it's 
fast in the V3 and, and about 2x faster in the learned index. But even the write heavy workload, um, where you now have lots of inserts, it's, a, it's still about 2 to 3x faster in the V3 and 3 does a magnitude less space for the index. Um, an interesting factor that's happening in these learned indices, though, is that from time to time, because the index gets skewed, you may have to reorganize some pieces or some parts of the index. Basically, think of it that you're assume we're doing just linear functions, that the linear approximation of this density there um, uh, is, or of the CDF, is, is not doing that well, and you basically need to find different split points. So therefore, if you look at the insert latency, that you see that basically the B plus three P50 as well as the P99, well, there is you know still some orders of magnitude different, but um, the um, you know maximum latency of the B plus three is basically capped at about you know between 10 to the four and 10 to the six, so about 10 to the five um, nanoseconds. But as you can see that in Alex, actually this goes quite up high. This is the one with the triangles, and the main reason is that from time to time, we actually need to take some pieces of Alex and need to completely reorganize them. So this shows that Alex actually has these latency spikes, which are not really desirable in, in a real system. So there's much more work to be done. So it's, you know, the open question is basically here in this whole um, area of learned indices is, is this the right approach in a way? I mean, the current indices beat baselines on all data sets um, that we've tried it out. But is it really simple enough? I mean, the beauty of a B plus tree is that it's super simple, that it has a really nice and simple um, concurrency um, algorithms, uh, concurrency control algorithms as well. And the question here is, is this actually simple enough or can we make it even simpler? And um, how do we actually deal with these latent tail latencies and all the complexities of, of some of the algorithms? Um, so, as we talk about the learned X, right, I've now sort of talked about two examples of where I took existing components and replaced them with models. Now, what these models need is um, they often need input. And I think the design of featureization is, is another interesting open problem in this whole space. So for example, the models, they work over some representation of the query and the database. Um, you know, a query or a query workload or the schema or some physical characteristics. For example, assume I have this relation, you know, these three different relations, A, B, and C, I have a simple query which selects star from A and B with a joint condition um, and a selection condition down here. One simple way of encoding this query is basically I encode the query through a feature vector. So I basically create a feature vector where maybe my first three bits are the relations which appear in the query. And you can see this is actually A and B appear. My next few bits are the selection predicate that I have. And maybe what I do with the selection predicate, I encode the selection predicates by the percentage. You know, here maybe A1 less than 23 is say 10% of the tuples get selected, whereas I don't have a condition on, on A2 and B1 and B2. And then maybe I have some joint predicates. And, and, and this is, this is um, an, an example that's being used in, in some of the learned query optimization work. Um, but if you look at what actually happened in uh, text, audio, video, and, and many other problems that, that we also see um, that I've seen here at Microsoft is that the best models directly work on native data. Right? It's basically, again, the search story. The search story was that we started out by indexing using inverted indices and using very simple ranking functions, um, just uh, sort of BM25 or the statistics. Then we had teams that built features from, work, from, uh, from documents. And now we basically just take the actual documents and directly feed them into a deep net. Um, so the best models in text, images, video, and audio work directly on native data, but they didn't start up like this. And, and there were lots of interesting intermediate steps, you know, k-grams and hierarchical presentations and so on. But now there exist very powerful models and, and one-shot learning approaches that directly work on it. So what's a good featureization of a database and a query workload that we can use for, for some of these learning-based approaches? And another open issue that we have, I think, in the community is this whole question of um, what is our infrastructure and do we have shared infrastructure? So, so this is um, a great paper that I would recommend all of you read, which is um, a paper by, um, you know, Das et al., which um, talks really about what's happening if you do auto tuning in practice in a real cloud infrastructure. Um, um, 
basically what and, and, and so the, the steps are you identify a representative workload to tune, you tune the workload to identify the best index configuration, you implement these index changes, detect regressions to the index changes, you know, you revert some of the changes potentially, and then you know, maybe you detect if more tuning is needed due to changing workload or data. While this sounds all fine and nice, and especially you know, in theory, that's very easy to do, like you know, the auto tuning algorithm that I gave you before, right? I mean, I can really sort of let my algorithmic creativity loose on this problem. However, if you look at how this is actually done in a large-scale cloud database system such as Azure SQL DB, um, you have a whole architecture um, that um, is there to uh, collect data. Um, it's basically this control plane is actually the brain of the system. It's a really highly available service that manages this whole fault turn state machine of auto indexing for each database. Um, there are lots of different components. Um, and um, basically um, what, what this all does is that it collects data, which is then used to build models, which are then used to recommend indices. Right? And, and one of the core parts is this query store, which is basically a repository of query plan choices and performance, and it aids basically in performance troubleshooting and tuning. Um, it has lots of statistics and lots of data. It captures and says query compilation, execution history, compile time stats, and runtime stats. And, and so the, the big problem that I think that we as a community face is um, where do we get these workloads and, and data from? Right? Again, so in, you know, in Azure, I have easily a million SQL databases. Um, in, in the, um, you know, in, in a way you can argue that the deep learning revolution was you know, partly started through the creation of ImageNet, right, which was sort of a small research paper, um, but then really quickly evolved into an annual competition to see which algorithms could identify objects in, in these images. Um, and this was basically, I think, really a catalyst for the AI boom that, that we're experiencing today. So what is sort of our image net for the database community? And, and remember that we have great benchmarks, but they're designed for a different purpose. Right? They're designed for the purpose of challenging the database infrastructure and not for the purpose of creating interesting problems for the control plane and the learning that, that we have to do here. Um, as we think about structured data processing, right, there are now all these large-scale pre-trained models out there that are used for many natural language processing tasks, um, a transformer-based model like BERT and GPT-2. And what is there for our next set of challenging benchmarks and how do we know that they will actually generalize to the interesting cases that we see in practice? Um, in many environments, even for noise suppression um, uh, or, or, or other, um, you know, for the control plane problems that we have in, in Teams and Skype, we have built a gym. Um, and a lot of advances come with, you know, different algorithms that you can then exercise in the gym to see how they actually act with the environment. We don't have a gym for database systems. And if, if there's a gym, creating an index, you know, may take you seconds or minutes. So doing a lot of experience with this gym is going to be super expensive. Um, so what is the right kind of gym for database systems? Um, and then also, how do we actually create an open source infrastructure um, that we can all benefit from and make our models and ideas comparable? Um, so, so what I'm basically a little bit worried about is that there are only a few big players that are able to innovate because we don't have a good way of sharing queries and data in a privacy preserving way. Um, so one of the things that I've been super impressed in, um, by at Microsoft and which impressed me again every day is how we treat customer data. You know, I work in the Office 365 cloud. I have never seen a single piece of customer data. Um, I cannot even get at it. I cannot log into the machines where our services are running. So there's a really um, extremely high bar, or actually a gate between any developer and real customer data. Um, so, so we cannot share any data with customer data. So how do we actually either share data in a privacy reserving way or get real the workloads um, that, that people have shared so that we as a research community can, can innovate? And, and that sort of brings me to, to my last point that I wanted to make, namely, um, I think what we see in industry as well as what um, we also see now here in the database community is that the way we uh, develop software is changing. Right? So I talked about the change switch from software 1.0 to software 1.2.0. But I think what's interesting is 
that this is not only a change in technology, but it's especially a change in process. Right? If, you, if you look at previously how software or, or today how software is being built, right? You define some tasks, design, design some modules, you write, reuse the code, and then you do a bug and release. Right, for software 2.0, this has changed significantly. Now a big step is how to collect the data and labels, how to prepare data and train the model. Um, and, and these steps have changed um, the whole process. And actually, um, as we're replacing code with models, right, think about what we actually had to do in background noise suppression to come back to the original problem example. Right, we created synthetic data and captured real data of speech plus noise. And we round through the data sets. We created some no reference audio quality predictor. Um, we created a background noise gym. We did some training with the gym and you know, potentially some privacy serving online training and AB uh, noise suppression, right? AB test the noise suppression and then monitor and repeat. Right, so, so these are a lot of steps, namely exploring, defining data to be used, identifying data sources, creating, collecting data and so on um, that take a lot of time for which the tooling that we've developed doesn't have the same level of maturity. Especially if you look at um, any candidate that I'm, for example, interviewing for my team, they are really excited about the training, right? You know, should I use Relo? What should be the number of convolution layers? What happens if you overfit? The learning rate should be this. Should I use L1, L2 norm, or this other loss function, right? What model sizes? How should I do architecture search? You know, what's the quantization, and et cetera, et cetera. But if you look in practice, um, they, th you know, they, they think actually this, this is what they're gonna spend all their time on. But if you, think in, if you look in practice, actually, there's all this other stuff around that takes much more time than the middle step. Especially if you look at the middle step, it's basically differentiable. Right? So, so there's great methods that allow me to take the model and then make the model much, much better. Um, what I would like to do is really I'd like to, in some sense, differentiate across the whole data life cycle. And so this is the last point that I want to make, right? This change in process, which I just talked about, maybe from the, you know, actually the, the process is a little bit more difficult, right? It's the inner cycle where, where basically I work by myself, right? Um, you know, when I machine on my code, this is maybe all what we as researchers and PhD students know and work. But the outer cycle is what allows us as you know, Microsoft, for example, to scale to you know, code bases where we have a thousand developers. Right? After I am done with my little piece of code, the code goes into code review, right? Then testing, there's a continuous integration pipeline, there's release management, there's monitoring, there's issues management, there's documentation needs to be written, there's analytics over the code, uh, and so on. Right? And, and so I think for Software 1.0, where we have a traditional program call tree with human-generated code, um, I think we have pretty good tooling now where we understand both the inner loop and, and the outer loop. Whereas in Software 2.0, where maybe I have this hybrid program tree now, right, where basically, well, I have maybe now a module that's a neural net, maybe plus human code, or just a deep net, right, where I have a program that may consist out of some synthesized piece of code have a program that constantly changes based on the data that's flowing into the program, which are the actions of humans who are interacting with it, right? We don't have such great tooling. So in a way for software 1.0, we have managed to, you know, in some sense tame the complexity of software development. We've made an engineering discipline, right? We have modules, object-oriented programming, version control interfaces, et cetera. And in a way, the software that we have is also immutable. And the different components, they influence each other only in a very well-defined way through interfaces and, and APIs. And for models, we may, don't, we may not have really many of these tools yet. Um, we don't really know how models influence other models. And maybe that even happens with a human in the middle. <coughs> but you know, what is sort of this engineering side of software aligned for software 2.0? Um, I think that's, that's still a, a big problem. Um, I don't have time to go into the details here, but um, let me at least um, give you my intuition of what I think this right-hand side could look like. Namely for repeatability, we have maybe model pipelines and environments for freezing code data and parameters. You know, for testing, we might have gyms, which I already talked about, right? We might have test generation with GANs and so on. 
um, for modules and decomposition, which is really a way how we scale, you know, programming to large teams as well. Maybe we have, you know, pre-trained models. We have transfer for learning and we have co-training. Um, and, and maybe some of these um, uh, mechanisms will help us. You know, debugging is actually a big issue, right? Especially in software 1.0, the two of us can look at a piece of code on the screen together and we can debug it together. It's much harder to do uh, in a deep net where you sort of look at a complex architecture with lots of weights. Um, and there's, you know, interesting work now happening to do this. Um, similarly for abstractions, right, we don't have such high level abstractions as we have in software 1.0 yet and software 2.0. And so on. Okay, with that, I want to stay on time. And as a summary, I think software 2.0 is happening. Um, it will change how we build software systems. Um, it will change how we build database systems. I talked about um, some ideas that, that we have specifically been working on in terms of learned indices, and uh, especially in terms of learning how to um, automate uh, physical database design. But especially, I think software is really going to change how we're going to develop software in the future. And, and what this also means is for us as a community, where we're at the core of all of the data, we really have an exciting future ahead with us with lots of high impact research problems. Um, with that, I want to share you another thing that we did in Teams. Being both technical and creative. So I just wanted to check in with you guys and talk about democracy is responding to those scandals. My apologies. Okay, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johannes. That was a really interesting talk. And I think uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff there for PhD students to take home. And I think uh, they would really appreciate that part of the talk also. Uh, we have uh, time for quite a few questions now. Uh, so uh, please use the chat or the Q&A <clears throat> things which are available on your Zoom screen to ask any questions. Uh, I see one question up already. Um, uh, let me ask that to mm -hmm. uh, Johannes. The question is, what frameworks, languages, DNN, Lib, et cetera, are you using to design and optimize the models? Are all those only for clouds, or can they be used for standalone DB systems in the local machine slash data center? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So I think there, there are um, at different components of this question. So let me, let me sort of try to, to, to get to them. So first of all, I think um, the future data systems are all going to, to, uh, to be in the cloud. I mean. I've seen this where, you know, early days at Microsoft, maybe customers sort of wondering about the cloud and now it's, it's more like about how fast can we move to the cloud. So let, let me talk about um, the cloud database systems. Um, so, so the question is now what frameworks are you using? And, you know, I, I'm actually quite agnostic, right? I think this is again a very rapidly evolving area. Um, there are lots of great frameworks out there. You know, um, if, you, if you go and, and look at any deep learning tutorial or so, um, you know, you can use any of the, of the major ones, including TensorFlow, PyTorch, whatever you know, whatever you have. So I, I think the choice of framework is is much less important. I think, especially since all of them rapidly innovating, um, as the change in how software is developed overall. Um, I think that that's the bigger change. And by the way, I, I just see here a comment. If I can't be see Johannes, I'm happy to turn my video on, but I can't. I don't know, Rhonda, whether you can allow me to do that again, but. Um, it says again, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Let me check. <laughs> While that is going on, the, anyone yep. else who has a, a questions, please go ahead and ask it on chat or on the Q and A. There's another question on the Q and A. Yes, there's another question. Uh... What? Let me open that up. Yeah. Uh, so, Lax. Uh, I say it's a great talk, Johanna. Some questions. What is the impact of software 2.0 and more specifically DBMS 2.0 on debugging and explainability? And what does all this mean for future job prospects for software engineers? Nice question. Uh, yeah, I, I think this, this is a great question. Um, so um, I think debugging and explainability is, is, is a big issue. Um, and I think that's also an area where there's a lot of research right now. You know, how can you take one of those 
but, and, and they were traditionally actually even called black box models, right? Because you didn't understand what was happening inside of the model. Um, how do you actually um, explain what's happening inside of a model? And I think that's still an open research area. I think there are also lots of other interesting questions, for example, questions of bias, right? For example, I mean, if you look at this background blur, right? Is the background blur now, um, how well it works, the segmentation, is it biased by the training data that I have? Right? Maybe I have a lot of training data of men. Maybe I had a lot of training data of, you know, people who are middle-aged, um, and therefore it doesn't work for, for, uh, for humans as well, uh, well for, for the general population as well. A good example of that is I have a, um, a daughter who, who is now 12, and we had one of the very early Alexas. And in the very early versions of Alexa, when she was talking with Alexa, Alexa completely ignored her. It seems like the speech recognition of Alexa just didn't understand that there was a human talking to her, even though when you know, I was talking to uh, Alexa, she clearly understood me. So I think we'll see some of these bugs, and actually we have to be extremely mindful and thoughtful about um, such issues. Actually, Microsoft has a great program, both internally as well as externally, about bias and fairness in, in AI that I would really encourage you to look at. Um, so within Microsoft, even we have very strong restrictions um, and regulations about you know, looking in, inside of training data for bias and, and fairness. And there's actually also tooling emerging out of Microsoft that I would encourage everybody to use to look at. Uh, Lax's question vanished, but there was a second part of the <laughs> question. Uh, uh -huh. What was that, Lax? Uh, you can type it in again uh, since I'm not able to see the question. But meanwhile, sorry. let's move on to the next question. Yeah, sorry, uh, this the question. is a question yeah. from Ilin. It's, it's, sorry, I, I, I did it. He's, he asked, what does it all mean for the future job prospects for software engineers? So what this software two zero means for the future job prospects for yeah software. yes i think um th that's a great question so i think what it means is that um maybe the percentage of experts that we need in certain areas is shifting right for example um i think you still need experts in certain areas for example if i look at our and in teams uh, experts in networking in, in, in coding and so on but I think maybe you now also have see a larger and larger um, population of you know strong software developers, uh, software developers who basically also have a strong ML background. It doesn't mean that these are the people who are the ML scientists, but these are people who can apply machine learning in in, in a very thoughtful and, and careful way to existing problems. They either either use pre-trained models, or they can take existing tooling and build new models. And I think such skills will become more and more important for all areas of computer science. Actually, if you think about, again, that's sort of part of the thesis of this talk, that the way we develop software is going to change in the future. And I think models will become much more first-class citizen in all pieces of software that we're going to develop. So we still can't see Johannes. Yeah, I, I'm trying to turn it on, but it says always, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. <laughs> My apologies. Can, run, can someone turn it on? Because we have three more questions. Um, I'm Ronald? trying. Uh, it does not give me that, that ability. Okay, we apologize for the technical I'm very meeting. sorry. This is the first session, so uh, yeah. luckily this has not been a major issue. Uh, we can continue on to the next question. Uh, there's uh -huh. a question by Fortis Sava, which I think uh, Johanna has already answered, so I'll skip that. Uh, there's a question from Ilan Tolosky which says, in your experience, what are the biggest challenges regarding managing the model lifecycle? And in your opinion, the possible solutions to some of them? Yeah, I think, I think one of the biggest challenges is that the whole tool chain that we have has completely changed. Right? If you think about previously, we had, um, you know, we have really good tooling for code, right? We have GitHub, we have test automation, we have tools for abstraction like functions modules you know apis libraries we have really tools for debugging we have for abstractions we have high level languages you know we can do performance tuning we have profilers optimizing compilers and so on and, and i think for software 2.0 it's not clear what that tool chain is going to be yet for example i mean here i could imagine that um and, and again there's there's no tooling developing around this that if you, if you have a model, the model is not static. So the model basically has a life of its own. It means as new trend data comes, on, comes in, the model changes. What this means is you could even imagine now very different types of attacks. Maybe you could imagine a data attack on a model 
where I basically feed biased training data to a model with the goal that the model actually deteriorates in the future and is not any more representative of the population that it actually needs to make a prediction over. Um, so I think the whole tool chain as well as everything around it that we used to have for code and that we actually in some sense felt like we are getting a handle and has now changed with, uh, with software tool at all with models. Thanks. Uh, the next question which I'd like to ask is from Yujia Zhang. Uh, the question is, does the traditional complexity analysis fit the new model? How can we analyze the performance of algorithms in software 2.0? And I think uh, this is particularly relevant to the mm -hmm. uh, index uh, question, uh, index uh, learned indices, which uh, you right. talked about. Yeah. yeah, so let me actually answer this in, in, in two different pieces, right? One piece is, um, what does it mean to have a model in software? And actually, if you have a deep model in software, the complexity analysis is actually pretty pretty nice because you actually just have um, a fixed inference um, over, let's say, a deep model that you're doing, and therefore it's actually very easy to understand what the complexity of that model is. Um, uh, now, it, with the, the indices right now, when you incorporate models into software, um, especially with some performance critical parts, you have to now worry about what's happening if the model if the data has shifted and the model is outdated. So you basically now have to, in some sense, look into what are you doing um, if this data has shifted and where do you take the time for um, retraining the model, right? These are sort of these performance bumps, these latency bumps that we saw in the learned indices, right? Which is not a nice behavior. And maybe one idea would be, well, maybe I treat the tree a little bit like an LSM tree that I build one tree, I use it at the same time, you know, from time to time I build another tree on the side and then I switch atomically over, right? It's similarly like, um, you know, when you look at the, the auto admin approach that was explained in, in the paper from Microsoft, right? Where basically you sort of watch and see whether anything interesting is happening and from time to time, you know, so you have to try to, to build new indices again, right? Sort of this continuous approach of, of retraining that, that you have to watch out for. I don't know whether that would answer the question. Uh, Yushia, feel free to mm -hmm. uh, follow up on your question. Mm -hmm. uh, but meanwhile, uh, let mm -hmm. me ask a question here. Yeah. Uh, last year's uh, ICD 2019, the 10-year mm -hmm. best paper award was for a paper which basically used ML to predict query running times. Mm -hmm. um, and that was certainly a very interesting paper, uh, mm -hmm. quite ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. uh, but what was interesting is in one year after that, in 2010, there was another paper which basically said that, uh, look, uh, you know, there are a few parameters for query running which we need to learn, uh, but it's not an, uh, good to do an end-to-end -end prediction. All you need is to learn these parameters and that can be learned uh, because it's common across all queries and then uh, that worked better than uh, full end-to-end -end analysis. Uh, and this may be because uh, the amount of training data is limited or it mm -hmm. takes a really long time to tune some of these. Events. So uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, so, so I, I feel like this is just steps in a journey, right? And especially, I think one of the biggest questions here is, and, and you know, I, I did some um, experiments together uh, with uh, Jennifer Ortiz and Marta Balazinska on just even trying to get a little bit of a handle on how do these different models perform? And I think one of the biggest questions that came out of that study is that, how do I know when one model actually is really much better than another model? Because every data set that we try it on has certain biases and it has certain kind of characteristics of the distribution. So, so especially in our case where we have now potentially complex joints, where we have complex table layouts, where we have you know, multi-way joints or you know, foreign key joints, um, how do we actually know that if we now replace something with a model, um, it really performs much better. Um, an example is query optimizers, right? There is right now, I think, very interesting pieces of work um, where you basically take the query optimizer and you don't actually now decompose it necessarily into selectivity estimation and plan enumeration anymore, but you basically do everything in a single shot. Again, this is working right now for very simple queries against very simple optimizers, such as the PostgreSQL optimizer, which is really not as good as a commercial optimizer. Um, so, but I think it's, it's a super interesting piece of work and a super interesting, okay, now I can actually start my video. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so it's, it's a super interesting uh, piece of work because I think what it actually shows is that um, learning can do well for some certain class of queries in certain distributions, 
And I think what this means is now as we get more data, as we get a better handle at all of this, um, things are just going to get better. I, I don't know whether that answers your question um, directly. Yeah, I think it does it mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Johannes, can I uh, can I ask uh, just follow up to to show yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Thank you for the talk. Uh, great talk. Um, when you say a model, I mean, what what do you mean when you say a model? Is it just a collection of uh, parameters that we have to learn? I mean, is it the space of things that you? I mean, there is a very big uh, range of what uh, you know people mean when they say a model. Yeah, and in a way, you can just say that a model is basically a function that you know takes some input and produces some output. And the main difference is that the model is not constructed by a human by writing code, but has been learned from data, right? And so it's it's like a machine learned model. Maybe I don't understand the, the gist of your question. Um, are you worrying whether the model has some randomness in it? Are you wondering about um, the complexity of the model? There, there yeah. are lots of different aspects of a model, right? All of the above. I mean, in principle, a model could be a Turing machine. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you have to somehow uh, define some space of uh, some... some uh... Correct. And uh, you're right. So I've not been very um, uh, precise about this. I mean, so by models, I mean, maybe the kind of models that um, mainly appear right now in the literature, which are, let's call it um, deep models, as well as maybe uh, tree-based models, such as gradient boost decision trees or so. I think those are the models that right now our community is looking at. And even with deep models, I mean, we can look at, um, you know, RNNs or LFTMs or so, because maybe, you know, you can think of a query plan as consisting of different steps. And so therefore maybe a model with some memory might, might actually um, have some advantages there. But, but I agree, I mean, I'm not talking about yet about um, complete code synthesis or, or learning code, right? Which, which is another interesting direction um, that maybe the NIST community is starting to look at as well. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. we are almost out of time, but uh, mm -hmm. there are a few more questions. Maybe I'll see if I can pick anyone mm -hmm. as the last question. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a question from Murad Uzani, which says, as we introduce more learned text components, do we need to rebuild the different DBMSs from scratch or keep modifying the existing ones? I think that's a pretty important question. Yeah, I, I think that, that's a super uh, interesting question. And the answer is that I, is probably that I don't know yet. Right? For example, if you look at, um, so what, what are sort of big architectural changes in, in the recent history that happened in, on the database side, right? One of them clearly was the move to the cloud. And at the beginning, what people did is they basically just, like what everybody does, is they take the existing data uh, systems and, you know, plump them into the cloud, right? And then build a control plane to manage all these data systems. And it was only after a while that we understood, and really Aurora was the pioneer here, right? How to build uh, database systems that separate out you know, storage from compute and actually use some of the existing infrastructure of the cloud um, uh, to generate a next generation of database systems that have much better performance, are much more cost effective and, and much better scalability. Um, really, I think what, you know, it took me a while to appreciate about the cloud, also working at Microsoft, the cloud is not about multi-tenancy and elasticity. The cloud is about having higher living building blocks that you can build on and therefore that accelerate your productivity significantly. And, and I think similarly now here, when we think about machine learning and database systems, it probably the first thing will be that we take our existing database systems and replace some components, um, maybe selectivity estimation, maybe query optimization, clearly administration, right? Which is what everybody's doing already. Um, and, and maybe then after a while, we think about, we, we have some realization of what this next generation database system will be. And for example, there was an interesting paper at CIDR um, last year, you know, SageDB, sort of a learned database system, and there have been other, uh, a few other papers around it. But still, I would say that a lot of these papers, they take still quite a traditional approach in terms of, you know, take the red book, for example, and, and, and look at um, uh, what, what's happening with respect to um, a database architecture and just take the different blocks and replace them with, with learned components. Um, so I think the big question is, what is the big architectural change? I think, um, that we don't understand that yet uh, enough, but I think it's probably going to come. And let me ask, I think the last question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so this is a question uh, which, uh, for which you can wear your professor hat, uh, although you're not a professor <laughs> anymore. Uh -huh. uh, the question is, uh, what changes, if any, do you believe need to be made in CS college curriculums to prepare for software 2.0? And uh, oh, so this is a general question. Uh, you could answer it in yeah. the context of databases if you wish. 
Yeah. So, so that that's a really interesting question, and especially um, uh, uh, so there is um a small team um of of people here at Microsoft, and, and we're looking with actually some of our academic friends at maybe even having a software 2.0 seminar. Um, so I would say it's maybe too early on to understand what um whether there should be a class on it or how it should be woven into the curriculum. I think most major CS programs now have woven machine learning much more in general, dealing with data much more into the curriculum of CS education. I mean, even if you look at the, the general software engineer, right? The software engineer now, because they look at services, they look at exhaustive services. So the whole notion of dealing with data and analyzing data is, you know, is, is part of the bread and butter of a software engineer. So I think data should just be a big role in CS, you know, computer science education. The second one is just to get a handle at models. Right? What does it mean to build a model? How to evaluate a model? What is the data life cycle of a model? Um, how to maintain a model? Um, I think just even getting a handle at both of these, I think, would really prepare people um, uh, very well, I think, for this, for this next step. Uh, so, if you will permit yeah. me, I would like to ask you a very quick mm -hmm. question. Okay. Uh, you, you ask the last question, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, and Thank I think you. I'll... Uh, try to bring in one of those. So in other domains, deep learning models like image processing, etc., turn out to be brittle towards some kind of resale attacks. You mentioned that in your slide as well. Do you see any issue on the adversarial aspect here as well? Or it's not a concern? And I would like to tie you up with the data availability issue because for small organizations, maybe they don't have enough to build the model to begin with. And the model can be brittle anyway. What yeah. do you no, no, I, I think it's, it's, it's a big concern, at least, I mean, we at Microsoft are super serious about this, not only about data attacks, also about fairness and bias and, and inclusiveness. Um, and I think what is going to happen is that we'll develop better and better tooling. It's like bug finding in code, right? If you look at real code, um, there are always more bugs and you decide which bugs to fix and you fix the most severe bugs first. And I think the same thing will happen with models, right? As we sort of look at models and get a deeper understanding of models, we understand both sort of small box of problems and as well as bigger structural problem, uh, box with, uh, with models and we'll find ways to fix it. So I think similarly at software 1.0, right? I mean, we believe that we can write the perfect piece of code, but actually code is organic. It changes and, and it moves on and lives and, and it gets better over time and it changes over time. And I think the same thing will happen with models and our understanding of models. Um, so one of the things I've been most impressed by is uh, how models the power of models changes over time. I mean, even the simple model as predicting of who I'm going to send an email to, at the beginning, nobody thought, oh, model is always going to be too slow. It's never going to work really well. And now it's, it's, all, it's all models, it's so much better. I mean, if you look at Visual Studio Code, which does code completion, which is, which is really amazing technology, right? You could imagine that much more technology is coming there as well. So I think um, in all of these pieces, we'll have models, we'll make some mistakes, but I think we also have the right goal in mind and we'll create more and more tooling to make sure that we all do the right thing in the models as well. Darshan, one quick question okay. which is very important for ICDE because uh, everyone's talking about AI, artificial intelligence, but I believe the data is sort of the bread and butter. So could you please uh, sort of elaborate very quickly on this, how important is data and how the data community can be really relevant with all this hype going on with AI? Well, so there are two different questions, two different parts of it. Um, and, and I know we're running a bit over. So, so data is really the lifeblood of, of you know, of, of in some sense, even a competitive mode sometimes, right? Because the more training data you have, the better the models get. I mean, models advance significantly, but then people in NeurIPS, they put their code out there and you can take the newest code and, and try to train it on your data. So data is often a competitive mode, even though now we have seen, you know, tools like GBT2 and, you know, BERT and so on, that are these large pre-trained models that you can adapt to different domains, right? So if you're in a new domain, data clearly is, is the mode. Now, what does it mean for the database community? I think we as the database community who manage the data, who manage access to the data, um, who look at the data lifecycle overall, I think this is one of the most exciting research areas in general. I mean, I'm super excited about both the work that's happening in our community, um, you know, the direction that our community is taking. And I think our community is also relatively broad, right? Our community is focusing on data, but that means, you know, going all the way through the data life cycle, but with data always at the center. And the other thing that I like about our community very much why I'm so excited about is that our community is building systems, 
space, we don't only develop theoretical algorithms, but in the end, we actually go ahead and we implement these algorithms, we try them out in real systems, um, and that is actually the ultimate proof. Um, you know, in, in, in industry, what matters in the end is that you build something that the customer appreciates and likes, um, and without building anything, um, you know, everything is just theory. So I think this combination of taking interesting or, you know, developing the foundation, taking the foundation and all the way up to a real system is, I think, a big strength of our community, which, spread, which spreads, you know, going all the way from ICDT and POTS all the way to, like, segment VLDB and ICDE here. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, this is a point where everyone normally applauds, but uh, this <laughs> virtual conference, uh, I don't think you can hear it. A few of us can. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure there is a lot of applause uh, virtually going on out there. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, talk, Johannes. Uh, thank you very much.